in single file in a PL sequence script. Uh, in PL sequence script, yes, uh, yes. On one file, we have 10, 15 blocks. We can execute individual blocks and uh, either uh, we can execute entire file. You mean in Python script? In, uh, yeah, can we do in the same way in Python script? For example, I have 10, 10 blocks. Okay. Just I want to see results of one block. Okay. Is it possible? Uh, yeah, it is possible, but it's not possible uh, uh, using uh, traditional. Uh, I, I'll show you. No, I'm just I understood what you're asking. Uh, for example, generally, what we do is uh, um, for example, this block, right? So when we execute, you can see this is just a uh, this triangle uh, is just a way to execute uh, in the sense that it gives us handle to run it on the command line. Or usually, what we need to do is uh, this is current working present working directory users digant uh, by code, and you need to look at um, in fact Python or Python three, and then you you need to say that okay execute this particular program so this is actually how you traditionally you would uh, has no selection to copy this is how you traditionally in real time we do this right? yeah so this is how you do it usually uh, there is Okay, it's like copy. Uh, okay, let us get out of that. Okay, just Python. Okay. And then... oh, there is a new line here. Okay. Okay, this is uh this is how you usually execute. Okay, so it takes it, what it does is the starting of execution is it will start executing from line number uh, line number one itself. So it doesn't matter uh, like in uh, C or C plus plus. What we will do is uh, usually we write a main function, right? Void, and then uh, some main function, and then uh when the there are two steps uh, you have to remember. One is a uh, compilation and one another is uh, a runtime uh, execution. In Python, uh, there is no compilation for like single files like this. Uh, so it starts executing it uh, directly here. So uh, it's like a script. So just like shell script, shell script doesn't get compiled. Right? So it starts running the command. So it runs from here. Okay. So if you want to run certain, only certain blocks. Uh, so what I would generally do is uh, if you do not have access to say some uh, external IDs, uh, like Jupyter Notebook, where you can uh, execute section by section. Um, it is actually called cells. I'll show you right away. So uh, I would, what I do, do is usually uh, put all of them in a function, like uh, say def test func and then And then I'll call, I'll I have made a block of this execution and then I'll call that function. So this is how you will try to test uh, if you do not have access to Jupyter Notebook. But uh, with Jupyter Notebook, uh, what happens is, for example, I'll show you test I find. So if you install Jupyter Notebook and install the corresponding extension, Jupyter Notebook extension, here like this you will have ways to execute section by section as you uh, wanted like for example i can copy this and paste this here
and then if I need another section, I can do something like that. This only this section got executed, and here similarly, only this section gets executed. It is possible using uh, Jupyter notebooks, so it has a concept of cells. So, all of these are uh, whatever we create, you can actually create code or a text or a markdown. In fact, now Jupyter uh, uh, notebook support different languages as well. You can change it here, like if you click this point. It will say what sort of language you want. You can actually like, select the language and do it section by section. So this is uh, done easier using Jupyter Notebook. But generally, we don't deploy Jupyter Notebooks to production. But in production, if you face some problems like this, then you need to do whatever I said, like uh, take that particular uh, snippet of the code, create a function, and then call it in the uh, in the uh, outside. So what Python does is it starts executing from line number one. It looks at the definition and it just makes the definition, it doesn't execute it. So it knows that, okay, there is a definition. It doesn't execute this at all. It doesn't even know that it is there. It is. It just makes a note. And when it gets called, it goes to that particular function and starts executing from line number two. So even if there is a, say, uh, some sort of uh, you know, um, runtime errors, you won't come to know until you call it. So that is uh, no, that is how the Python Python works internally. So it's a script that starts from uh, line number one without anything. Uh, if you if you execute like this, which is like actually typing Python and then um, this, and uh, in case you want section by section, create a function or use Jupyter notebook. Just you are if you are trying to you know play around or testing or you want to test the snippet step by step, then you can do this. This is actually helpful. Uh, from today, maybe I'll start using Jupyter Notebooks as well. You can install a Jupyter Notebook um, on your laptops. In case if you do not have uh, Jupyter Notebook access, uh, you can do, uh, you can actually use something called as a uh, collab Google listed as sent in. Uh, so you can create a new notebook. This is uh, provided by Google for people to, you know, uh, data science and uh, students to uh, explore. And you can actually start using Jupyter Notebooks directly without any installation. So here if I, I can do something like And also it has got a, a, a Gemini, uh, Gemini assistant here. You can ask, uh, say, you can ask any snippet of code and then uh, you can copy it and paste it here and then try writing it. But <clears throat> the thing is, uh, while picking up this code, uh, the reason that we uh, learn something deeply because we, we need to understand how it works, right? So that's the now actually nowadays coding is not a is not a topmost thing that you don't need to remember syntax or you don't need, need to remember any of the module names or anything like that. You just need to know how to like put things together and verify whether what you are trying to do is uh, is what you require. So to reach to that knowledge, you need to know uh, Python and then uh, use all these things. So if you do not know Python, what happens is you, you if there is an error, you don't know how to fix it. So that's the, that's the problem. Okay, so did I answer uh, your your question? Yeah, exactly. That's uh, that's what you you not say exactly got yeah. my answer. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let us get started. Uh, morning, everyone. And let me see if there are any more people waiting. Like nobody's in the waiting room. Okay, let, uh, let us just revise so that uh, we come to uh, try to connect the dots. So uh, in the in the first class, we learned about like components of the um, computer and how we are trying to um, manipulate them using programming. 
and then uh, this is something which you need to like burn it in your brain that python works like a script and then if there are multiple models uh, th there is a compiler but for simple commands it doesn't get compiled because it's already like pre-compiled for example if you are using um, uh, say an inbuilt function called length len len so it's already compiled so you're just trying to use that so then it gets converted to bytecode and then uh, virtual machine picks that section and converts that to translate that to machine code so it's uh, like that and then yeah the data types the reason that we use data types is to uh, assign or reserve some uh, memory from the ram and then this is how uh, these are the elements or the data types that we have in python uh, so that you can uh, name some uh, part of memory using this and then you can manipulate it we looked at uh, strings uh, uh, strings are nothing but um, a list of uh, not the lists list but it's, it's a list of characters which are like uh, tightly packed together so it is immutable you cannot change anything uh, in between for example if you cannot replace t from uh, some other character directly so if you want to do that it will create a new string so it's immutable strings are immutable and lists uh, we saw that you can access using the index indexes and you can actually slice it if you have done the assignment and there is also something called as negative indexing you can also access last element using minus one so you can try that as well and tuple tuple is exactly like list in terms of memory allocation but it is immutable so you can um recognize a tuple by these braces so this is round brackets and the list is a square brackets set uses uh, flower brackets but it doesn't have key and value and set is good for uh, searching uh, because it uses hashing internally and uh, dictionary also has internal working same as set uh, but it has key and value mapped so just like clock room um, yeah, in the uh, railway station and then you can mix up data types uh, like list inside dictionary dictionary inside list and so on so if else and we looked at loops uh, loops are repetitive tasks and we sort of um, put a loop uh, using for keyword and then for in some iterable so it will it will give you a new element not the indexes like in um, c or c plus plus and then what else did so we saw the uh, function for we write functions to make sure that we we are able to reuse certain part of the code so code reusability is the idea behind function and you can actually make it part of library and you know deploy it uh, use it as many times as you want so lambda functions will learn it so uh, yeah scopes um so this is uh, just for you know um, when you face a problem that some sometimes your variables doesn't get changed or it gets sort of overwritten you need to understand what are the scopes uh, sc so there is a difference between the scopes in C and C++ and uh, Python. This is the difference. Um, yeah. Scopes are limited to the function level and at the file level in Python. But here in C or C++, it is between the brackets. That is, these are called code blocks. Inside those code blocks, uh, you can't access outside those code blocks in C. And then we looked at little bit about objects of, uh, and we also wrote a data type on our own own on our own so how to create objects on our own so uh, this is the basic concept but today we'll look at um ob object oriented programming uh, a, a, in some more elements of that so and then we looked at files files are uh, nothing but on the disk you need to remember hard disk hard disk is actually a peripheral um, device for a computer and you don't need a hard disk to run the uh, computer so it is just to store the data which might get lost when you actually boot the system for example uh, if there are systems uh, where uh, you're trying to uh, say some sensors uh, out there in the field which is uh, trying to capture the temperature of certain 
uh, place uh, like weather forecasting it, it is used for like people who do the weather forecasting right? so they have sensors all around and those sensors when it gives uh, it, it detects some something and it sends some uh, data to back to uh, the servers but it doesn't have might not have uh, hard disk so it has a small uh, sensor it doesn't maybe doesn't even have an os so remember that computer operating system is a like a software built on uh, the hardware so that you can manipulate it so that is one of the things you need to like keep in mind so you're, you don't need to like uh, dive deep into that but keep in mind and then we looked at uh, soon after files we looked at uh, xml and json formats these are structured formats so that we organize the data in such a way that uh, they are interrelated and we can access uh, the elements uh, in a way that humans uh, think so example is uh, like this india karnataka then districts and data inside that so xml and the json uh, format wise uh, even in YAML format wise, uh, the concept wise, it's all the same. Only thing that X, uh, XML uh, uses is that it uses a lot of tags. So in order to get rid of these tags, we people came up with JSON. JSON stands for Java uh, Script Object Notation. Um, so it was built for internet and then we, uh, and now we are using for everywhere. So uh, when you are uh, building systems where humans are not consuming uh, so most of the data today is not consumed by just by humans so like uh, transactional data and um, the updates on your phone everything uh, which you do not do it manually you don't trigger it manually for example uh, sms's or uh, uh, the messages in whatsapp right through uh, whatsapp maybe it all comes through json format and then uh, there is internally code written to extract them, things like that. So yeah, that is about uh, JSON. Uh, and then today, okay, uh, we'll learn these things uh, later. Uh, so today we'll learn about objects and object-oriented uh, programming because we just learned these things, um, an introduction to objects, okay? So let me just, uh, start with the concept so and then we will try to uh, understand uh, how that is realized on the code um, in a while okay so uh, <clears throat> we saw that objects means there are two things involved one is uh, we are packing two things together one is attributes and another is operations so these operations are called uh, different um, terminologies for example operations interfaces uh, functions uh, uh, like modules inside the object and things so all, all mean the same thing there is a function which is inside that particular class so wh what is a class uh, so when we talk about class it's like uh, it's like a blueprint so it doesn't have uh, especially in c++ and uh, java it doesn't uh, by, but python is slightly different but um, just remember that class is just a blueprint so what do we mean by blueprint is we just have, uh, we actually do not allocate memory uh, for the class. It's saying that when the compiler picks up that particular um, section of the code where the object is uh, defined, for example, class something, uh, something say car, and then I have these attributes and operations defined inside this. So uh, say gear and etc and then functions saying that say apply break so when i do this so uh, when i write this code so we are not actually accessing or we are not uh, allocating the memory so when we write a class it's a blueprint then how do we create objects out of it is like using this particular um, variable that we have defined and we can instantiate it's called object instantiate in instantiation so this is how we this part when we do this is when the memory gets allocated on the ram so now you have a way to access the functions and 
um, use these attributes, um, fill these attributes. So it's like uh, fill in the blank. Like when you uh, when you create a memory, it's like all uh, blank initially, and then when you start uh, putting the data, it it gets filled. So you can create as many uh, objects from this blueprint. So this is how the class and objects are differentiated. And then now, um, why do you require object-oriented uh, programming? Why it came into picture is um, um, simply because we want to transfer our thoughts, the way humans think, uh, to the uh, onto the uh, system or via programming. Why? Because uh, I am not the only guy who is writing code or um, you know, um, putting code into production, right? So there will be a team of people and also it changes over the period of time. And um, there are legacy code here, uh, which we might be using in the company. They're probably 25 years old, 10 years old and so on. So it's uh, people change, right? So uh, some people who have written code, now they have already retired. So in, especially in uh, embedded systems like telecom, and um, like switches and all this, uh, those um, um, industries, the code was written, for example, TCP protocol, like the kernel that we are using. TCP. So it is all written like way long, like probably 30 years ago. So how do you make sure that um, readability is, uh, comes into picture, readability is easy. And then we also should be able to manage these objects in such a way that we can move things around just like, uh, uh, you know, you move furniture around in the at, in home in such a way that it is convenient for us. So this um, idea of moving things around uh, is actually called refactoring in, um, in, in software. So if you have, uh, imagine if you do not have this object oriented programming, the negative effects or uh, the difficulty would be to figure out what belongs to where and then moving things around. So object oriented programming uh, solves that problem. Second uh, thing is, second thing is um, you can also reuse the code. First thing is uh, readability and uh, maintainability. And second thing is <clears throat> we can also reuse the code. So what do you mean by reusing of the code is once you have the blueprint, like here we have for class, you can also uh, use this car to create another blueprint. You don't uh, have to reinvent this car blueprint uh, again. You can simply say, um, use this blueprint. And on top of that blueprint, I need some more extra or additional blueprint. So how you can do is using uh, there is a syntax, but generally it is called as, um, uh, say, this is car and this is car, uh, electrical car, let us call it electrical car, and then you can use car. So what happens is you inherit or you take all the items which are already there in the uh, blueprint, and then you can additionally create your own um, attributes. For example, for electrical car, maybe I have a, a, you know, a charging point. So this is a new element, which is not there in the old one. So this is called as inheritance. So I'm just adding one attribute and all these functions are again, uh, usable. That means you are not even reinventing the wheel. I am simply using that. So this is one of the reasons, uh, that the software industry ran, you know, uh, in a fast pace because you don't need to reinvent uh, things like you use uh, whatever is existing and then inherit and then start using it. So this also happens when you use modules in Python. Um, so yeah, so you, you get the idea. So that reusability is called as inheritance. Inherit. And then um, you can also, uh, for example, say, let us take uh, apply clutch. Okay. 
for example, upper brake, or let's take upper brake. So we have one uh, car and I have got in, I have an, another car, which is electrical car. And I need to redefine this function, apply brake, probably be, because it uses so one technology and now I'm using, trying, I'm trying to use another technology using electrical car. Maybe uh, when I put the brake, it gets, um, uh, you know, sensor detects and does something or something like that. So maybe it automatically applies. We don't know. So you kind of rewrite this, uh, overwrite this particular definition of apply brake. So this overwriting or redefining this applying brake um, is uh, something uh, called as polymorphism. So you can use the same function to do multiple things on different objects. So in, in Python, it's slightly different. We'll look at it. Uh, so you don't need to worry about it. Uh, because um, there is no real po polymorphism uh, in Python. We overwrite it uh, and then we do it. So that is one another thing. So we learned about like inheritance and polymorphism. So polymorphism is like same function, different uh, functionality or altered functionality. And then uh, we can... Um, so this entire thing that we do, right? The uh, attributes plus operations. So this is actually called in um, programming uh, terminology, it is called encapsulation. So why you are encapsulating is uh, like other object doesn't know what is inside that. So other part of the code doesn't, uh, is not aware. So you cannot simply, other code simply cannot call say used clutch directly it has to instantiate an object and use it so there's, there's a simple definition of encapsulation and uh, there is also something called as um, private variables public variables protected variables and things like that but um, in python we only have uh, public and uh, private so the protected part is uh, not there um, so because it's it's um, the design of the python is uh, is to make it available for everyone everyone who is uh, who is not even a programmer like it should be usable by everyone so programming should not be something which is limited to like who study in the um, academic um, uh, like academic cycle and then they are start writing programming right so that needs to be broken the reason it needs to be broken is because the all the knowledge and the domain knowledge is with the people like scientists teachers and uh, like people who actually do the mechanics and uh, people who design artists and those people so those people should be everyone if everyone starts using that so we uh, the industry or the that particular you can be creative and people can you know put out more uh, things for like humanity so that's the that's like uh, the bar that uh, python sets everybody should be able to program so the coming back to this protected variables so it is a slightly complicated um, concept so we don't require that in uh, python but there is a way to uh, simulate that using um, you know um, some sort of conventions so uh, just remember that this is a difference in c++ java and Python. There is no protected, but there is a way to tell other programmers that uh, this is protected. Use it uh, carefully, sort of a uh, message. Okay. So these are like basic concepts in objects. So these are uh, these are not something new that we are trying to learn. It is already there in our day-to-day uh, -day world. Uh, for example, mm -hmm. this particular bottle. Imagine there is a factory which produces this bottle. So. Uh, once you put the uh, like raw materials, uh, the control of this uh, say color, shape, uh, make of the um, cap and all these things, it is probably controlled by a computer and maybe that particular um, bottle maker um, would be having different uh, sorts of uh, production lines and maybe he has one single code which inherits uh, the common attributes of a bottle like how many liters it uh, picks up and color and all these things 
and then uh, there is instantiation of these objects and then these raw materials are like controlled via the code so probably that and then for example like um, it happens in uh, like even in uh, humans and uh, other animals right so we inherit genes from our parents so there are like basic characteristics uh, so it gets carried over so it's already there so that is about inheritance and then um, how polymorphism encapsulation and yeah so this is all just to make programming easy so these concepts should be actually taught in the beginning so that it's we can relate things and uh, especially in c++ uh, when, when we start studying this it it is usually put like okay this concept needs to be studied in you know semester sec 2 or next uh, advanced level so it is not i don't think it's an advanced level so in terms of concepts it's um, it's like very basic level so it is not a um, big thing so just remember that so don't uh, avoid yourself coding writing code in object oriented uh, way uh, thinking that it is advanced it is not advanced it is it is already there so any questions in terms of uh, uh, objects polymorphism under the um, say we will look at it uh, one by one in uh, okay so let me just close this and I have created some Jupyter notebooks so that uh, we don't have to write programming programs directly. Yeah. On the weekend, I created a lot of Jupyter notebooks. Um, this is uh, actually helpful for teaching and you can also use Jupyter notebooks now, because first thing you need to learn is how to run a program on the command line. Now we have learned and uh, on IDs, you have that, um, you know, uh, run button and then it uh, runs the program. So you don't have to worry. But uh, generally, it's like code doesn't know there is a shell which will trigger your program. The shell also doesn't know how to run your programs, right? So how do you bring these two things together is low. So you type Python and then fix that up. So similarly, when you have, um, uh, <clears throat> when you have some program, say shell program which can trigger the python program right so it needs a python program and it you need to execute the program so that is how they are uh, connected but once you get used to that and now you know how it is actually run so there is this particular um, jupyter notebook where we can use and you know, uh, make uh, run the sections of the code okay so i'll share this uh, um, Jupyter notebooks, uh, so you don't have to like take down or copy or anything like that. It's available on uh, GitHub. I'll sh share that. So uh, yeah, concept-wise, we learned how we sort of created uh, blueprint, right? So the, and also we saw it in one of the classes how to create a new data type. So how to create a new data type? Instructions are actually called as blueprint. So this is a blueprint. Um, so we saw why init is there so init is initialization so there is also function so all the functions uh, when we start using um, this particular uh, double underscore let me annotate double underscore so these are like predefined uh, functions which are um, available for you to redefine so init is one of such programs, uh, one, of, one, of, one, of, one of such functions. Okay. So, and then uh, you can write your own function and write usual thing. And then also there is something called as self that we uh, studied in previous class. So self is nothing but the object itself. So in Python um, and C++, uh, so there is something called as this pointer. It is similar to that, but this is not a uh, like a pointer, it's object itself. Okay, so here we are creating a blueprint of for dog and dog has one functionality here. Uh, so it's just bark and we initialize dog using say its name and age. So these are just the parameters and you, you can um, take those parameters. These parameters are here. So this is a separate variable altogether which is sent inside this. 
and I'm making it part of this class. So as we understood that this dog one or a new object and this self is both are same. So when I when I use this self dot something, so we are essentially doing is we have a container and then we are just putting this name inside that, assigning that name and age inside that. So this is actually a different variable. So once it we once it goes out of this section, this particular memory gets released later, which is done by garbage collection in Python. So we we are not deleting ourselves manually deleting. So this is a different variable, and this variable gets sort of attached to this. So that is how you can take a, take variables and then put it in a container. So once you do that, uh, so how do you uh, sort of access those variables is like this, like dog one dot name. So that is how we will be able to access that particular variable. So that's about uh, simple. Uh, so this is actually revision of whatever uh, we did. So uh, any any questions here? Because we did this already. So if you have any questions. Okay. So let us look at how how inheritance happens. Um, so I have an email. So this is one class, uh, and there are two more classes here. So let me try to annotate and try to be. So there are um, there is this one animal. Okay, just. So this is a this is our class which gets inherited. So this class is actually called as base class. Okay. So you can see that it's just a. Let me text. So uh, we are trying to use uh, this particular base class and then we are trying to inherit base class in this. So this is how you, this is a syntax for inheriting. So you define a class, another class, and then you just like function parameters, you pass it like this. So all this blueprint, like this name and this particular function becomes part of this particular um, object. So we have animal, which is a base class and inherited class. You can we have it inherited twice here. So it becomes like dog. And um, here we have cat. And you can redefine those functions, which is like overwriting. If you do not redefine, so you'll be using the same um, functions. So you are not overwriting the definition of a function. So because we have inherited blueprint. So imagine there is a, like there is a hundred functions for this particular animal. If you start writing every characteristics of animal, probably it uh, exceeds hundred. And then you are creating a new um, object, which is like dog. And then it itself has probably 120 characteristics. And you will have to rewrite all hundred uh, functions and then again plus 20 functions. So this is not very scalable solution, right? So that is how inheritance solves the pro uh, problem. Uh, and, uh, you know, you can reuse the code already, which is already there. So the you might have a thought like, we are doing the same thing in functions as well, right? So because we are trying to put things together and we are uh, using it. So function is just a, uh, we are not packing the functions and attributes together. So we are not making it as like an object. In fact, even function is an object in Python in terms of concepts, but for our memory model that um, that like humans think, we, we do not have these functions and attributes tied together. So that's the important difference here. And you can create as many uh, like yeah, inherit. And there is also like, you can in inherit from cat to say some cat, which is like 
uh, like Indian cat and then probably UK cat and things like this. So you can keep on inheriting this. So that is how you, you can uh, reuse all this. So this is a syntax. So this is just a you know just to show you the syntax. So the concept wise, it's uh, it's whatever we uh, we learned. Okay. So let me execute this. So you can execute these things um, section by section. Um, and yeah, you can also have um, some empty class, for example. So when you whenever you have this column written and uh, say i'll try to run this so you can see that it says indentation error so there is also a keyword called as pass so pass doesn't do anything so pass is like just it passes so you can see that um i have removed the function uh speak from dog okay now what happens is we learned that uh we are inheriting all the functions and the attributes from animal so even this is inherited here. So, but the default action of this particular speak, wherever you inherit, even if you haven't defined, is like it says some generic sort, which is coming from here. So you have we have not written a function here inside this, but there is already a function. You can actually go one step deeper, similar to what whatever we did in the initial classes. For example, I can print dir of say dog and we execute it so dir stands for uh, directory so uh, so this are the list of so double underscore or all the functions inbuilt functions or default functions which when we create an object so there are several of this and these are the only two things that we have defined. One is name and another is speak. Name is a attribute and speak is a function. So in fact, you can actually uh, get to know whether it's a function or whether it's a, um, uh, whether it's a variable as well. So if you just print say dog dot speak so i do not at this point of maybe you are using some other library i do not know whether it's a function or a variable so if i do this print this you can say you can see that there is a it's a bound method inside this particular animal dot speak uh, and this is the uh, this is a um, address of that particular function so when you see method it means it's a function so if you change this to say name, it will just print the value directly. So that is how you identify functions if you do not have access to the uh, code base. So, okay. Uh, now we saw without even, uh, uh, you know, uh, without even changing uh, anything, uh, we got this particular speak inside this because we, this is an empty class, but with even an empty class, uh, we saw that there are several functions which the, uh, which Python has already defined for us. Those functions uh, can be used for various uh, uh, other things. For example, this particular init. So init is given by default, but we are reusing or overwriting it for our own, uh, suit of run requirements okay. so this is concept wise and then this is how you kind of realize the concept uh, using uh, python okay so this is the basic structure of the class and its inheritance so it is just a, just like looks like a function variable passing so let us learn something about encapsulation so this is nothing new concept wise you are learning it's already there in our day-to-day -day lives Okay, so let us look at this. So we have a class called as a bank account, and then there are about three functions: deposit, withdraw, and get balance. Okay, so just get, get let get uh, yourself with like uh, familiar with the code. 
if you look at this uh, three functions so when you start reading the code um, so don't jump into you know uh, read line by line for example you go to deposit you start reading from here bank account and there is init function there is self and double underscore balance and then you don't do not read line by line just like we read newspapers right so how do we read newspapers we do not jump into the um, you know uh, the actual content of the uh, news right we read the headlines and then we read, read the sub headlines something which strikes us we start reading that right so unless you are like uh, uh, like you want to read newspaper line by line so so similarly while reading the code uh, look at the headlines headlines are nothing but like definitions and you kind of create a mental model of what is there so if you look at bank account okay bank account is there and then there are like these are the headlines which are functions and then you can look at okay deposit means there is some sort of logic so only when there is a you want to modify or you want to understand there is a problem you can jump into this and then you can uh, you can start reading line by line and understand this okay but you don't need to uh, so this is just a two line program but uh, generally when you are trying to browse through the code others code so you don't need to like jump into the actual section so this is how you kind of create a mental model so you read headlines and create now we have three functions bank account and then these are the functions and uh, here we are trying to learn uh, something called as encapsulation uh, which we uh, looked at encapsulation is nothing but telling something which is uh, private and uh, how do we mention that this variable is a private variable is using this double underscore so once you have double underscore behind any variable so it it is like a um, private so let us try to okay generally you would be able to access print account dot balance let us see what's happening you can see that i got an error okay saying that bank account doesn't have any attribute called as double underscore balance so let us simply add one more variable here okay let me just remove this double underscore that's a little better okay let me do it here i'll just try to print rather it was what this because this are getting called and it is trying to access that variable which is not there. What else are we expecting? Balance okay here. Okay, if you look at this, so I have modified this particular variable double underscore to like no underscores at all. So this is this is a public uh, attribute which can be accessed. Uh, using these objects directly so why do we have private variables is uh, imagine this particular balance is a public variable and in other code unintentionally you can do something like account that balance is equal to um, say two million dollars okay and then if it's actually a balance uh, bank um, software you are unknowingly or uh, unwantedly you're trying to you know uh, put two million dollars in someone's account right so this is the uh, understanding or this is the idea behind private variables so private variables is not actually for the end user it's for the in between the developers so this bank account probably it's part of some library because we cannot write all the code right in in in, in your company one person cannot know understand all the and of course for for example what what if he leaves the company what if uh, he retires what if he you know passes away or like that so it cannot be like people bound right so there needs to be like some protocol some understanding between the developers so that is how this private variables or private attributes comes into pictures to automatically protect 
at the execution level itself or the in C++ and in Java at uh, compilation level. So it's saying that, no, do not modify this. So this, without this, it's just a um, public uh, attribute with double underscore. You can see that, um, so there are errors here, which means I'm trying to access some variable which is not there, but it doesn't give me error because uh, we just saw that until you call this function, Python doesn't know that there is this particular um, error. So it just knows that, okay, there is there is deposit, but uh, I haven't verified the errors within uh, inside that particular function because I haven't encountered it. I, I never read that code. So that is, uh, that is the nature of Python. It executes line by line until it gets called, it, we do not know. Okay. So, okay. So that is about private uh, variables, why we use it and uh, how do we use it in, in Python. So any questions here? Okay, I hope that is clear, private. So public variable and private variable. So just remember that private means it's not private for the uh, for the end users or UI, even UI is a end user. So it is for somebody who is using this code and trying to modify this. So using this as like, as a variable. Okay. So that is about um, encapsulation. Encapsulation, we saw private and public. So just remember that. So in Python, private variables are just a, like a gentleman's agreement. We, if, if there is one underscore, so it's a private variable. So it's just a convention, but the, you know, since it's a, uh, there is no compilation process in Python, it is difficult to implement uh, protected variables in, in Python. So that is the reason that we do not have protected as in um, as compared to C++ and Java, but there is private and uh, public. Okay, so polymorphism, yeah, so polymorphism, we, uh, we, yeah. polymorphism is basically uh, trying to override. So that is what we did speak and uh, speak, then you can, uh, there are two objects here involved. One is bird, another is dog. So this is the blueprint of the bird. So bird and dog. And then at this point, um, this line, we do not know what type of speak I'm going to use. So in fact, we can do something like, hmm, I'll, I'll also tell you something related to design patterns as well. So, so if, if you look at this code, we are instantiating bird and we are instantiating dog here. So there is um, a function which is not related to this class at all. Like not, it is out, outside this part of the code. So in this function, we are trying to send this particular object as a parameter um, and then we are trying to access that parameter and then access that um, variable. So at this point of time, this function doesn't know whether it's a, like which speak to call, right? So how does it know that which speak to call, whether this or this? Of course, in this, uh, there's two separate data types. So whenever you call speak, so the type of dot, so we, we saw type, inbuilt function, right? So, so that depending on that type, we call that data types speak. So that is uh, actually uh, like, um, we are using uh, like a polymorphism, like we are trying to call speak, but automatically it gets resolved to something uh, which, which is actually inbuilt to that data type. So this animal gets, uh, whenever we send dog here, dog dot speak, and here when we send bird, it's bird dot speak. So this is like polymorphism. This, this, this is something which we, we have already seen. So in fact, so where is it useful? So this is just a, a snippet which uh, which shows how it, how it works. So where it is useful is, for example, I have, um, say pattern, uh, say something called as factory. 
and then maybe i have uh, instantiated a lot of bottles like in our previous example bottles okay so i might have several uh, type of bottles like um, say pink bottle and then red bottle based on its color and may make one make two and so on so once i have created this in in terms of object i can simply loop through in a factory uh, 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 at a factory function or a factory um, um, module i can use this list of bottles bottles and i can simply write a uh, for loop saying that say i or b uh, generally use uh, for example if there is iterable which is called bottles just use a uh, bottle if it's s uh, or just use b uh, do not try to use i everywhere because that's a habit we need to break for a bottle in bottles we get all the list of bottles and then you can do bottle plus say uh, get volume get volume so if you do this so all of these are different objects because we have inherited from uh, say bottle and uh, it could be different uh, makes and types uh, so bottle and then when i try to call get volume it automatically calls the functions of that particular data type because data types are different now so it recognizes. So this this pattern is actually called as like factory part pattern. In fact, in C plus plus, if you have to implement this, um, it's actually a pain. So we did it in like few lines of code. If you write it in C plus plus properly, it will take like fifty lines of code because you need to create a abstract something and then you need to write a um, like code which reads through that uh, pointers and so on. Okay. So this is actually called, this is one of the design patterns actually. So a design pattern where we do not know the internal uh, implementation, but you can actually use its function without uh, knowing its internal uh, implementation. So, so that pattern is called as, um, I think it's called as build factory. So it comes under factory design patterns. Okay, so that is about, um, polymorphism uh, so you don't uh, generally when if you're writing uh, if, if you're using python just for scripting right so you don't essentially write uh, with classes and uh, you know uh, make it happen like properly designed and things like that but if you're writing something which is which you think that other programmers might be using this module or rewriting this so that is where you start writing uh, classes so yeah, uh, try try this out um, on yourself. So there is also something called as abstraction. So abstraction is uh, something which we use in our daily lives, uh, just like many other um, concepts. So let us just try to understand what is abstraction. For example, if I say, um, uh, if somebody tells me, uh, ask me to ask me to fetch uh, a bottle of water. Um, so I'll just get the, I do not know, uh, no, nobody tells me that, okay, get the, unless it is like specifically uh, mentioned that get a water in a black color bottle and go to this place and try to get this, right? We do not uh, want such uh, detailed instructions like humans. So for example, there is a pen and somebody says, give me a pen. So you'll just give it. So it's an abstraction. So pen is an abstract idea. So in the class, if I uh, if I uh, if there are hundred students sitting, and if I ask you to uh, imagine uh, a pen, and uh, write a chit saying that um, what pen that came to your mind, probably out of hundred, I'll uh, all of them won't be unique, right? Because you probably uh, you somebody might have written Reynolds pen, somebody might have written Hero pen, somebody might have written something else, blue color, red color, whatever. So this sort of abstraction is there in our uh, general understanding. Uh, so this abstraction, how do we say, how do we convert this into language of programming is abstraction is something which you know that, okay, it is this, 
but I do not know what are the exact details internal to that. Now, if I ask you to imagine a white pen, probably that set of pens that we have uh, tried to imagine narrows down. So now you might be having different companies pen, but it's a uh, white color pen. Now, uh, again, I'm going to ask you to imagine a Reynolds pen. So now everybody is like, okay, no, now it's Reynolds pen with white color pen and then cap is like blue color and things like that. So now all of us together, we started imagining that particular Reynolds pen. So what are we trying to do is from the abstraction, some pen and we put some more um, data or uh, data points to that and then some more data points to that and narrowing down to Reynolds pen. Similarly, uh, if you want to realize that in programming, so how do you tell uh, the computer that something is abstract? So if I ask you to create a pen or to, if I ask some factory which is producing pen to produce a pen, obviously he'll ask me like, sir, what sort of pen do you want? Or what exactly do you want, right? So he collects the information. So you cannot create just a pen, but you know that the notion of the pen, pen is something which is say, not a book, not something else. So that level of uh, thinking is called as abstraction. So how do we define uh, abstract uh, functions or abstract classes in Python is like this. So in C++ or uh, Java, we use a keyword called as abstract. Or uh, there is also, uh, I forgot the keyword in Java, but there is a keyword which uh, tells uh, whether it's an abstract or I think it's you using something function is equal to zero, it will become an abstract uh, method, something like that. But yeah, uh, regardless, so there is a way to tell computer that you cannot create an object using this. So I cannot simply create a shape, right? And then, but it is very important in coming stages, I will redefine it and um, make different uh, shapes out of it. So here, this is how you create. So this is abstract method. And then area is one of the common attributes of any shape. So I, I have a section or a function called as area. And then I redefine it in a rectangle. I redefine it in circle. So in this case, I'm, so inheritance is a must in shape, right? So I have a shape and I have inherited from a shape to a rectangle and same thing here, also here, circle. In fact, I can make this, uh, again, I can inherit, inherit this rectangle to different uh, sorts of uh, rectangles and circle probably different sorts of uh, circles. Uh, maybe now I'm creating 3D rectangles, which are cuboids um, and circle 3D circles, which are now spheres and things like that. So I can keep doing this. So now uh, what now it becomes easy, right? So now you have thoughts and then you are trying to uh, put that on paper. And this is a way to just decode our own thought uh, in through the computer. So that is how uh, this particular object oriented programming and the things that we are learning comes from. Okay. So yeah, so this is, uh, let me just execute this. There is the execution here. Yeah, get used to this uh, Jupyter notebook, it's nice. Okay. So let me try to create um, some and shape. Yeah. Shape doesn't have anything. So let's try to execute this. You can see that I'm trying to create shape, which is an abstract class. And it tells me that you can't instantiate abstract class shape with abstract method area. So if you make one of the methods as an abstract, so class becomes abstract because now it doesn't know how to get, get around area. What does area means? So that this is the error that you get. So what we're trying to do is we are enforcing the programmers, programmers who are going to use this particular pro, uh, program 
not to instantiate shape at all. So shape is a abstract method. So if you want to use this, the functionality of this, take this, inherit this, and then use it. Imagine that this is in different uh, file and this is in different file altogether. So this file was written by somebody else and these things are written by somebody else. So that is where all these object oriented concepts uh, make sense because there are multiple programmers who are trying to, like for example, if I'm an architect, I will write abstract methods, abstract, uh, define abstract uh, classes and say that these are the functionalities. I don't care about your in internal implementation whether you use uh, bit um, uh, manipulation or um, proper multiplication to get me the area. So you can be using anything. But this is how I I need area out of this particular function. So this, uh, these are the like four important concepts in uh, object-oriented programming. So abstraction and then inheritance and encapsulation. So we will look at, uh, uh, you know, uh, static method and class method, but this uh, at this stage, uh, uh, we don't uh, need it, but we will look at it at when we start writing uh, unit test cases. So you'll also know an example where those are used. And uh, yeah. so any questions here? We are past the time, but yeah, we can spend some time.